Hi, this is Sergeant Betsy Brantner Smith with the National Police Association, and this is the NPA Report. I have with me a guest today that uh, I am so excited to talk to and so excited for you to meet. I'm going to guess a lot of you already uh, know her, but uh, she is a, a, a prolific writer and author, and she has um, some societal expertise that uh, I wanted to talk to her about today. So Naomi Schaefer Riley, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. So um, as we were just talking off the air, um, a few weeks ago, my uh, daughter, who's in her 20s, and I were listening to a podcast that you were on, and you were talking about a book that I already had in my library. And uh, it, the, the book is The New Trail of Tears. And I really um, encourage everyone to read this book and to understand the issues facing Native Americans today. And specifically today, we want to talk about um, Native Americans and uh, the criminal justice system. But I do want to go beyond that because I really don't think most Americans really understand the circumstances that a lot of Native Americans um, live in in our country today. So where should we start, Naomi? Sure. Well, there are a lot of myths and misconceptions out there, uh, as you mentioned. Um, I think the first thing that a lot of people don't understand is what a reservation is. And that's where a lot of the problems stem from. So a lot of people know that we sort of pushed American Indians onto reservations as we experienced our, our westward expansion. Um, but the laws are different on reservations. And most strikingly, the laws are different with regard to property rights. Um, so the land on reservations is held in trust by the federal government for American Indians. The only other people that we hold things in trust for are children and people who are mentally incompetent. Um, and so that tells you something about kind of the modern way we think about American Indians and kind of the, the very patronizing kind of condescending policies we have toward them that actually have been embraced in this weird way. Um, I think, you know, particularly by the left, but not just by the left. I think people think we're protecting American Indians by putting them on these reservations, but in fact, Act, we're restricting their rights significantly, their individual rights and their property rights. So for instance, you can't actually really own property on a reservation. It's held in trust from you, which means, for instance, you also can't get a mortgage. Um, you also can't use the land the way a lot of Americans do. So a lot of Americans, like if you wanted to open a small business, for instance, you would use the land or you would use your mortgage in order to get some capital out um, and borrow against it. But because the land is held in trust, um, it can't be used as collateral. And the lack of private property rights on these reservations has doomed them to a lot Lot of economic devastation, frankly. Um, so that's kind of the beginning of what you see on these reservations. But as we'll get into, you know, there are so many other issues that stem from that, you know, um, problems with regard to education, problems with regard to, you know, jurisdictions and law enforcement. Um, and so we, we think of these reservations as protecting American Indians, but in fact, we are hurting them significantly by keeping these laws in place. Well, and in fact, in, in reality, we, we see extraordinary um, poverty, right, on many of our Indian reservations. We see crime. We see suicide rates are, are in some areas, are off the charts. I live in Arizona, and we have a number of Native American reservations here. And my husband was a police officer on the Navajo reservation, and you know, he's explained to me, and that's why he was so interested in your book, because he had to have authority from the tribe to be able to arrest someone, even though he was in the state of Arizona, he was also on the Navajo reservation, and you got treated differently, whether you had a census number or not, you can explain that. And Sometimes that really hurts the crime victim, doesn't it? Especially Native American women and children. Can you talk oh, about that? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, just to give you a sense, I mean, one of the most striking things that I talked to people about uh, was, you know, very high rates of of child maltreatment um, and child fatalities that occur among uh, American Indians. And so I once asked someone, um, I actually asked three people who were involved in kind of um, dealing with kids and education systems on Native American um, territories, uh, if they suspected someone uh, was being abused, a child was being abused, who would they report it to? And one person told me they'd report it to tribal authorities. One person told me they'd report it to federal authorities. And one person told me they reported to state authorities. And, you know, that is, these are people who actually are familiar with the communities and, and they don't even know kind of where, you know, whose jurisdiction ends where. And I think that that creates an enormous amount of confusion. The, the court, the, you know, the tribal courts, you know, some of them are, are fine, um, but some of them are, you know, sort of just enterprises of nepotism and they don't have real law enforcement. There is definitely a dearth of people who are willing to do this job. Um, you know, you have enormous reservations that are just being served by just a few officers um, who can barely cover, you know, the number of emergency calls that are coming in. Um, so, you know, but I think, that, you know, the, the problems really, you know, start with the jurisdictional issues and, and nobody knows who's really responsible, which creates a kind of Wild West situation out there. Now, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is the federal government um, organization, if you will, that is supposed to um, be um, that is supposed to handle all the Native American affairs in a way that benefits Native Americans. Am I correct? Yes, yes. I mean, that's that's the sort of federal bureaucracy. Um, it has ballooned incredibly, um, but often, as is the case with federal bureaucracy, they don't really understand kind of what's going on in the ground in these communities. Um, and so there's a lot of micromanaging, but in the wrong ways. And, you know, many American Indians say the BIA actually stands for bossing Indians around. I've heard that before from some of my Native yeah. American friends. And yeah. I, I I know that one of the other things I've been told is that the reservation system, if you will, in the United States kind of uh, poo-poo's assimilation, right, into regular American society. Is that what you've seen in your studies? Yes. I mean, I think sort of from a from a cultural perspective, um, you know, it depends on the reservation. So some of the reservations I visited are some of the, the largest ones and some of the most economically devastated ones, like at the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, for instance, um, and a couple of reservations in Montana, for instance. Um, you know, what you what you find there is a kind of cultural sense that leaving the reservation is a form of, uh, you know, kind of turning your back on your community. Um, and, and so it, it, it kind of spirals. And so the, what happens is, you know, you, you do get kind of a brain drain, like, you know, some, some of the, you know, folks who are successful or who want something more, they just leave, um, because there's nothing, you know, there's absolutely no legal requirement that Native Americans live on reservations. Sometimes there's a misconception about that too. Um, about half of the Native population in this country does not live live on reservations. Um, and so they have the freedom to leave, but they often get this cultural pressure. And so, you know, I would speak to people who, you know, went to college, you know, uh, elsewhere in the country, um, but felt such pressure and such, um, you know, they would call home and say like, oh, I'm frustrated by this. And, you know, their families would just say, well, why don't you just come home? You don't need, you don't need to be there. Um, and it, it was kind of funny. It struck me as the exact opposite in some ways of what you find in immigrant communities, um, you know, that, you know, there you have this push to, you know, leave, get out, you know, get, you know, we, we came here in order for you to, you know, be able to be successful. Um, but in these kind of communities, and I think you get this, you can get this in kind of some inner city communities too, is this sense of, no, 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 like everything's fine here. Like you don't, you don't have to prove that you're better than the rest of us. You, you should just, uh, you should just stay. Or if you've left, you should just come back. And I think, um, you know, it, part of it is, um, kind of the isolation of these communities. Um, they don't often, you know, you, if you live on the Pine Ridge Reservation, the chances that you even know someone who goes to work every day are not very high. Like the unemployment rate is so high that kind of a typical middle-class American life is something you might only see on television. 
Um, and the education system is so poor that even if you kind of did want to leave, it's not clear that you would have the skills to do something somewhere else. Um, the, the schools, again, are plagued by nepotism. You know, the fourth grade teacher is going to be determined by, you know, knowing someone on the tribal council, not necessarily being a good fourth grade teacher. And part of that stems from the fact that there are no good jobs and there are almost no private sector jobs. So everybody is just kind of clamoring you know, through various kind of corrupt means in order to get one of these public sector jobs. What about some of the health issues too? I, I know that's not a law enforcement issues, but this is something I know that we see in the area that I live where we see this, um, you know, frankly, cl clinical obesity, diabetes, uncontrolled high blood pressure. Um, some of the tribes seem to have really uncontrolled health issues. How do we address that? Well, not through the Indian Health Service, which is kind of the federal bureaucracy that is on, you know, that is present on these reservations. I mean, if you ever want to see why, like, letting the federal government run our healthcare system would be a bad idea, like, try the Indian Health Service, because we dump, you know, billions upon billions of dollars into this thing. And it is, you know, so bad, you know, paper records that are just lost and doctors, you know, who are guilty of terrible crimes who are just passed from one community to another. It's just... It is horrendous. So many of these, um, you know, diseases are diseases of despair, depression, um, you know, economic circumstances. Um, you know, I mean, I think there is kind of an educational element there. You know, can you get people to eat healthier? But they're they're not so dissimilar from diseases that you see in inner city communities, which is, you know, you you have to like, you know, have hope and want to be able to take care of yourself and feel responsibility to your children and your family. And and if you don't, you know, if you're suffering from all of the there's so such high rates of substance abuse and alcohol abuse um, on these reservations that it, it's intergenerational. Um, that you know, it's it's hard to imagine how you just sort of turn that around and say, look, look, you know, here's you know, you should be eating more healthy fruits and vegetables. I mean, that's almost kind of the the end of the line. That's the result of sort of turning around once you turn around all of these other factors. Um, one of the biggest concerns for uh, American law enforcement is, of course, the McGirt decision that affected the state of Oklahoma. And um, uh, I'm also a police trainer. We do a lot of training in Oklahoma. And there's extraordinary frustration about the 2020 McGirt decision, which I'm going to ask you to talk about. And then there was a, another more recent decision uh, this summer that affected that a little bit. But but we actually are sort of drawing lines in the sand, right, because of this Supreme Court decision. Can you talk about it? Sure. I mean, I, I think what people don't understand, it, it, these, these decisions are often framed as decisions about the rights of Native Americans, that, you know, they shouldn't have to be... Um, you know, processed when a Native American commits a crime, they shouldn't have to be processed through, you know, our white system, or that, um, you know, if a, if someone who's not Native American comes on Native American land, you know, they should have sovereignty. You hear that word sovereignty thrown around a lot. And again, it's, it is not clear to anyone what this means. We are not going to treat these reservations like they're France. These, the people living on reservations are American citizens. And I think in all this conversation, you know, people really lose sight of that fact. And so because the folks who are on American, on reservations are American citizens and have been for a hundred years, we owe them the same protections that we owe all Americans, which is to say that these high rates of victimization, particularly for women and children on these reservations, are things that we would never accept anywhere else in the country. And we should not be accepting it for these people just because they happen to live on something that we call a reservation. We we have a duty to you know, offer them the same kinds of protections. And a lot of my work now really focuses on child welfare issues. Um, and so the, the rates of child abuse, um, child maltreatment, child fatalities that occur on these in these communities are just unacceptably high. And the question is, you know, there, there are actually some cases I wrote about in the book where, you know, you would have a federal whistleblower who would talk about, you know, kids who were being placed in foster homes where there had been a history of sexual abuse or kids who were remaining uh, in families where there was known, you know, sexual abuse or, you know, kids who were acting out in ways that were just, 
you know, would would set off, you know, not just red flags, but I mean, you know, fireworks in the minds of anyone who was involved in this. And weird and and people were just like, oh, well, I, I don't want to get involved. And so at one point it was a, a federal whistleblower who actually said something has to be done about this. And he was fired from his position um, as a result of pointing out um, how children were being made to live with these repeat sexual abusers. Um, and, and I think like our desire to sort of be more culturally sensitive and you know, um, and protect the kind of rights of adults in these situations because they're Native Americans is, you know, kind of overriding our sense of, you know, protecting the safety of these very vulnerable children. And that's an incredible frustration, I know, for law enforcement. You know, we're, we're, we, children are especially the people that, that we want to protect. And uh, and again, not just in Oklahoma, but in in so many other areas, um, very often our law enforcement officers are thwarted. And and something that I, I have found in my training um, and you have probably found in your research is that it's primarily non Native American people that um, are the law enforcement officers. Have you seen that? I mean, I haven't done a study of it. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, especially because on these reservations, there are typically federal officials. So you're sort of doing, you know, kind of folks who are coming from the FBI and, and things like that. And often, you know, people don't want to be in these positions forever. So you get some turnover, you have trouble doing recruitment, um, and, and you have to sort of have achieved a pretty high level of this in order to be working for the federal government in law enforcement. And so, yeah, you're going to get a bunch of non-Native people who are going to be working on these reservations, not because of any kind of discrimination or not because of any kind of, um, you know, desire for white people to be policing Natives more, but because they don't don't get enough applicants who want to be able to want to go work in these communities um, and who are qualified to do it. You know, it's something that I've I've found as I look into this issue. There's there's kind of two types of, of people that I when I talk to them about these issues, I come in contact with. There's sort of a faction of the American public that thinks that um, all Native Americans either own or work at casinos. Right. That it's all about casinos. That's kind of one stereotype. And the other stereotype is that Native American people are living the same way they lived 250 or more years ago on these reservations, and we should just leave them alone. Right. Um, you know, and those the are two very, around, very common stereotypes and questions yes. that get asked all the time. I mean, riding the pinto thing. horses and living in teepees and yeah. bizarre things like that, like a, like a cowboy movie. Um, again. What's the average reality of, um, you know, just an average Native American family living in the United States? And is it regional? Sure. I mean, definitely the casino thing. I mean, if anyone sort of gave five minutes of thought to it, they would realize that obviously there are only a limited number of places you could open casinos that would be successful. I mean, if you're going to open a casino in the middle of South Dakota, it just you're not going to get a lot of takers like there are not a lot of people there. You're not going to make a ton of money. But, you know, I visited, for instance, like the Seneca Territory, which is outside of uh, Buffalo and upstate New York. I mean, they they had made, I think, a billion dollars off of their casino when I visited there, you know, eight or nine years ago. I mean, it is an enormous cash cow. But what's so fascinating is that if you then go to the territory, these people are not living large. And it's and it's obvious why. I mean, the, the casino revenues are divided among, um, you know, folks who are enrolled members of the tribe um, in the same way that welfare checks go out. It's just money falling from the sky. No one had to work for it. Um, and at that point that I was there, I think when you turn 21, they would send you a check in the mail for something like $25,000. Now, you probably didn't have much of an education at that point. You didn't really work very much. And so someone sends you a check for $25,000. I mean, best case scenario is you buy yourself a new truck. But more often, it was just spent on drugs or other activities which were harmful to the population. So even in the places where you think there would be more money there, um, they're still living very hand to mouth, um, not on teepees. I mean, they're living in, you know, in South Dakota, they're living in broken down trailer homes. I mean, in upstate New York, you know, they're kind of, 
you know, old, like, you know, not very well cared for, for communities. I mean, that's another aspect of the problem of not having property rights is, you know, nobody is taking care of their property because it's not theirs. Um, and so you just, you kind of drive through these places there, there, you're just experiencing a kind of economic devastation. And the myth in the mind of Americans is like, oh, there are these beautiful, pristine places where people are the teepees and the horses and everything. And, and that's not, unfortunately, what they're like at this point. Just to give you a sense of, you know, your listeners a sense, um, one, one popular portrayal of an Indian reservation, which I think is actually quite accurate, was a movie that came out a few years ago called Wind River. Mm -hmm. um, and not only did it kind of show you like what a typical life was like on one of these reservations. But there was this, this incredible scene toward the end of it where various law enforcement members, tribal, state, federal, even some private security contractors, all pull guns on one another because of a dispute over jurisdiction. And I think it was just, it's so fascinating to see how it plays out in this movie. It's kind of a thriller. I mean, people might enjoy watching it, but I think it's actually enormously accurate in its portrayal of that problem. Naomi, you you research and write about uh, issues like this and so much more. Where can people find you? Where can they find your books? Where can they follow you and, and what you're interested in? Sure. Well, I'm a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, so all my work is at AEI.org. Um, also, I have a website, NaomiRiley.com, and they can get any of my books, uh, either The New Trail of Tears or my more recent book called No Way to Treat a Child um, on Amazon or wherever you buy books. And I, I will say that anyone out there, and, and of course, this is all of American law enforcement, anyone out there who um, is, a, is an advocate for children in this country, really needs to read that second book and also to see your work because really children, you know, not to be cliche, they are our most precious resource. And, uh, and you bring up so many um, really timely and in-depth issues when we're dealing with children. Quite frankly, we just have to do better. Thank you. Yeah, Naomi, thank you so much for spending time with us today. And if you would like more information about us, visit us at National Police. Dot org. Snap! Put the gun down! Put the gun down! Last year, law enforcement officers were involved in hundreds of thousands of use of force incidents. A use of force incident is when an officer must use nonverbal tactics to gain control of a dangerous situation. Put the knife on the ground. In many cases, officers have no choice but to use force when a suspect doesn't comply with a lawful order. Use of force is always ugly. No one likes it, especially police officers. Together, we can help de-escalate these dangerous encounters. Help police officers by complying with their lawful orders. Don't attack, attempt to disarm, or flee from an officer. Use of force is an officer's last option. Most incidents can be avoided by not resisting arrest. If you feel you've been wrongfully detained by a police officer, then seek a legal solution after the encounter has been resolved. Let's keep everyone safe. Comply now and complain later.